We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbean, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. There is a silent epidemic, something that people find difficult to talk about, even to their therapist. It is something we associate with the elderly, but can hit us at any age. What is it? Loneliness. The COVID lockdown has made it a more urgent conversation, but how do we make human contact in an increasingly disjointed, automated world? My witness is Sam Carr, a psychologist with a particular interest in studying human disconnection. He's a lecturer at the University of Bath and the director of The Loneliness Project, a partnership between Bath University and the retirement community provider Guided Living. His book, All the Lonely People, will be published in spring 2024. So Sam, how did you come to be interested in loneliness? Yeah, that's a really good question, Andrew. I think I kind of fell in love with the theory, attachment theory, many, many years ago, which is really about connection. But what I realized quite quickly is that if you study connection, you inevitably eventually have to visit disconnection and the loss of connection. So whilst connections are very important and they really support our psychological growth and well-being, it's inevitable that that most of us are going to lose them and we're going to experience disconnection. And I think I just became equally fascinated with that too, because I think it colours life just as much as as connection colours life. So what is your personal relationship with loneliness? I think like most people, loneliness has been a visitor in my life many times. And that starts right from the beginning. My relationship with my dad was always very distant, and I felt very lonely in that particular relationship. I think many of us experience childhood loneliness. We don't necessarily know it at the time, and we might not have the language to put to it. But often when we look back, we realize we were very lonely children. Um, I've experienced the loneliness of heartbreak a number of times in my life. I think we all have, haven't we? We all have, yeah. And and there's a unique, incredibly difficult to articulate experience of loneliness and heartbreak. I am a single parent, for example, and I've experienced the loneliness associated with that. So it's frequently shown up in my life, as it has in many people's, but often in very different guises, wearing different masks. So if it is a universal human experience, and you know both you and I have experienced it, why are we so shy about talking about loneliness? Because I think people would rather admit to being some kind of pervert than admit to being lonely. <laughs> That's well put. It's a great question because it's definitely my belief that loneliness is kind of a default setting when you're a human being. And the reasons for that, I think, are for me, twofold. One, if you look at the very way we come into this world, it's kind of like a literal severing between us and and our mother. We once were sort of symbiotically part of her. And then there's this brutal process whereby we are separate and we will be until we die. And so in some senses, we start off with a profound disconnection that I think we try to mitigate for the rest of our lives. The second reason, and there's a great quote I will read from one of my favorite fiction authors, is I think that there's a thing about being human that's essentially quite lonely. And one of my favorite authors, David Foster Wallace, he once wrote that you already know the difference between the size and speed of everything that flashes through you and the tiny inadequate bit of it all you can ever let anybody know. It's as though inside you is this enormous room full of what seems like everything in the whole universe at one time or another. And yet the only parts that get out have to somehow squeeze out through one of those tiny keyholes you see on doorknobs. 
and as if we're all trying to see each other through these tiny little keyholes. And for me, that makes great sense too. It's like there's a default position of loneliness, I think, in being human. And I think that if it's a default, I believe that it is clearly there's only an argument. If it's a default, it doesn't make a great deal of sense to pathologize it. Because if we do, we will create a sense of stigma and shame around something that might well simply be part of the human condition. Because thinking of one of the few clients that has ever seriously talked about loneliness to me, the sort of the, the feeling that's hanging in the room is, what is wrong with me? Yeah. And what you're saying is nothing. <laughs> yeah. You're just a human being and it's part of the rich tapestry of human experience. For me, that's, that's exactly how I see it. But I think that there is a discourse that's perhaps even more powerful and pervasive now than the message I just gave you that suggests that any kind of suffering is almost a pathology, something to be eradicated, stamped out, gotten rid of, and hence ashamed of. And there were many people in the Loneliness Project that I directed, we would arrive on the doorstep and they would the first thing they wanted to do was to distance themselves from the idea that they were lonely, even though they'd volunteered for this project. They were like, <laughs> I just want you to know, I'm not one of those lonely people, young man. A lot of people said to me, I'm not one of those lonely people. And as if I was some sort of doctor looking to study some sort of rare disease that they had or something. So I think people carry that, or a lot of people do, the idea that it's a pathology. And that must have been constructed somehow, somewhere, in relatively recent history, I think. So what do the academics tell us about loneliness? Has it been studied? It's been studied extensively. And in some senses, academics are contributing, I think, to the idea that it's a pathology to be cured. Um, there's Oops. a lot of literature on that. That's not the only way it's looked at. And it, I think it depends on the discipline that you delve into as to how it's portrayed. If you go into clinical psychology and medicine, you very much see it portrayed as a pathological state of suffering. And there's an argument that it is a state of suffering that people want to get rid of. Uh, if you go into more of the philosophical social sciences kind of stuff, which is my own area, you're much more into the realms of, yeah, this is a part of being human. Not a very easy one sometimes, but a part nonetheless being human. There's lots of attempts to define loneliness as well, and you will hear all kinds of terms floating around in the literature like social loneliness, emotional loneliness, existential loneliness. People try to dissect it and sort of cut it up and put it on a, on a microscope. So, yeah, it's been studied to death, quite frankly. It's been studied a lot. So let's break down some of these different kinds of lonelinesses and then let's see if there's anything useful that's come out of these studies. Sure. Because I think actually there are different kinds of loneliness. I do think that is actually quite helpful. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of three different kinds of lonelinesses. Perhaps you can add some more to mine. So the first one was one you mentioned, which is existential loneliness, which might be the sort of thing you get when you're a teenager, for example. There might be lots of people around. You know, you've got 30 other classmates. You might have brothers and sisters and a parents that you're living in on the same house. But you're feeling an existential loneliness that nobody understands you. You're the only person in the world that is X, Y or Z. So is existential loneliness, am I describing it in the right kind of way? It's funny, you know, I was reading a paper the other day on existential loneliness, and it still seems to be a vague term that different people will describe differently. I've definitely read accounts of existential loneliness that connect to what you just said, which is that kind of notion that nobody in the world seems to understand who I am or what it's like to be me. I've also heard it or at least read accounts of existential loneliness that seem to position it as, I feel alone because I can't find meaning right. in the world that I live in. I, I can't find anything to grab onto that feels like my existence is worthwhile, which is not exactly the same as, the, as what you just said. It's a slightly mm. different. So even, I think, the literature offers different ideas of what existential loneliness might be. But I think, for me, it's a deep-rooted sense that 
I can't find something to connect to that feels meaningful enough for my life to make sense. But it could also be, and the world around me can't see that in me either. But I think actually defining it in the way that you've done is really helpful because if you're feeling existential loneliness, once you've got a definition of it so that you've actually properly articulated the feeling, you can begin to think about what the answer might be to it. Because if you're looking for meaning, joining lots of social clubs might not necessarily be the answer. It might be much more going inwards or doing some kind of study or something. So, or listening to this podcast or listening to all of the episodes of this podcast. (laughs) I don't know if you can feel lonely with sort of like 150 people talking in your head, but possibly you can. Yeah. So let's go on to the next one I was thinking about. And this is what I would call the loneliness of a bad marriage or a bad relationship. And once again, there's no shortage of people around, but there is definitely a disconnect in a bad marriage, isn't there? Yeah, and I know that loneliness, Andrew. I've experienced that loneliness. Um, I think that there's nothing more lonely than feeling like the person you have chosen to be your intimate other doesn't see 90% of you understand 90% of you or want to get to know 90% of you, that can make being alive in a relationship much, much lonelier than being alive outside of one. And yeah, I completely subscribe to that. And the next one I've got is what I would call weekend loneliness. By this, I mean, you know, you're working in a, an interesting, all-consuming job where there are lots of people and lots of things happening. And to be quite honest, by the time you get home at the end of the day, you know, you're just pleased to close the door, watch some Netflix, have something to eat and just unwind. But when you come to the weekend, it's a bit of a, a lonely kind of thing, particularly as lots of other people are in couples. And so your friends might be available, you know, for a game of squash or dinner after work on Thursday evening. And maybe even on Friday night, everybody from work goes out for a drink. But on Saturday and Sunday, suddenly there's a great big expanse of what? Yeah. And again, I know that feeling of loneliness, that as you called it, weekend loneliness. I do know that. I think that maps maybe onto, there's a term in the literature that's often used, they use the term emotional loneliness and social loneliness. They're defined slightly differently. The emotional loneliness is like the absence of someone to attach to, someone to at least occasionally make you feel like you're loved, like you matter. You're special. Yeah, like you're special. Exactly that. And also, I think even the social loneliness, which is slightly more superficial um, in the literature, it's just the occasional companion to do something with, to to walk along the road with, you know, to... Go and see a movie with. Yeah, see a movie with, talk about the movie so that your perspective on it matters and you want to hear somebody else's. So, yeah, I think that also resonates with the way that the literature tries to carve up different dimensions of loneliness, which, as you say, is not futile. There's a reason and a point to doing that. So have I missed any divisions that you think would be useful for us to articulate? I mean, in the literature, there are lots of terms thrown around. We've touched on some of the big ones, but there are terms like objective and subjective loneliness. So, so oh, right. and the notion of objective loneliness is simply, if we were to look at you on some sort of geographical map, how many times objectively do you make forays into other people's territories or connect with them literally so how many connections do you have objectively and subjectively would be more regardless of how many people you see and how frequently and how many relationships you have do you feel lonely so there's that distinction often made and and there are people who you might objectively think would be very lonely because they don't have any connections or hardly any but don't feel it so there is that important distinction that the literature sometimes makes. Yeah, I have a a friend who doesn't actually see very many people, but actually feels very connected to themselves in a sort of um, 
I think perhaps the best way of describing it would be a sort of Zen Buddhist sort of kind of way, a sort of deep spiritual connection to something bigger than themselves or to themselves. So actually the number of people they see is sort of not really that important. Yeah, and I think that certainly for me in the last year and a half, you know, on a personal level, I've begun a um, Jungian analysis. All right. Yeah, I'm in analysis too. So oh, yeah. t- t- tell me about your experience. Well, for me, it's really interesting to build a relationship with my dreams, for example. Mm. And that part of me that sends me messages every night and seems to be watching over me and building a relationship with that inner aspect of self is really uh, helping me to feel I'm less alone. I'm not looking outwards, I'm looking inwards. And um, mm. I, I haven't really done that before in my life in that, to this extent. So I think we can look outwards or inwards for the answers to a default level of loneliness. So how long has it taken you? Because I think to get some kind of relationship with your unconscious, your self, as it's sometimes called, this is also could be called the inner self or the authentic self, as opposed to the masks that we wear. How long has it taken you to get some kind of relationship with, I'll use the term self? Well, I think that's an ongoing process. It's taken me about a year just to begin to trust that there is actually something there and that that something seems to care about me and seems to send me messages that lead me to believe it. I don't like using the term it, but I will. It knows what's going on for me and has my best interests at heart. It's taken me about a year to begin to trust that that's even plausible. I'm hoping that in the longer term, that relationship will evolve. So it's very beginning for me. I don't know about you, whether that resonates for you. Oh, most definitely so. I've been sort of on this particular journey for, I mean, not the analysis journey, but this journey of sort of trying to find meaning for 10 years, shall we say. But I think I've done about two and a half years of analysis so far. It's a long-term project. But I think the reason why I was asking the the length of this, because I'm not certain if we're going to come up with answers to loneliness. We'll see as the podcast progresses. But whatever it is, it's a long journey. It's not, you know, do five things, turn around three times type of solution, is it? Absolutely not. No, it's definitely not. But I think we live in a culture where that's what people are looking for. You know, if you Google loneliness, you uncover hundreds of those 20 things to do if you feel lonely to get rid of it kind of articles, you know. And I should imagine quite a lot of dating apps as well. (laughs) Yes, and quite a lot of that. So I think we live in a culture that sort of worships the idea that you can consume your way out of this or there's a quick fix around the corner. But like you just said, I don't think that's true for loneliness. So is it a modern issue or would if we could somehow be sitting here in, I don't know, the 18th century, would we still be having a very similar conversation, but probably using different words? Yeah, I mean, I've asked myself the same question many times and thought about the fact that, yeah, would this have been true a thousand years ago or something, for example? There is research on loneliness as a term, and it it seems like the word came onto the scene much later, reasonably recently, in the way that we use it. But I I struggle to believe that it wouldn't have been a thing. When did it arrive as a literary term? I can't remember the exact date, but there's a great book on it by a scholar in London. She, I think we're talking like in the last couple of hundred years. So it, it really wasn't a huge thing a thousand years ago, at least not in the language that we use. I don't know the answer as to whether it would have been existentially experienced existentially similarly to how we experience it. Because I think Hamlet feels lonely in some level, doesn't he? Sure, and I'm sure it must have been something humans were affected by, but perhaps they understood it, thought about it, narrated it differently. But I don't know the answer to that question in full, but it is certainly a question that I've pondered. Because, I mean, this could just be part of our general fantasy that everything there was a golden age when people weren't lonely and... Mm. The skies were bluer and smiles were warmer, et cetera, et cetera. But all of this modern technology, does it make it us less lonely? Because you and I would not be having this conversation if 
it wasn't for modern technology. But it's a different kind of combination than if we were sitting in the same room together. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've read arguments and I can see the, see the sort of logic in both sides that, yeah, if it wasn't for technology, certain people would never connect with certain other people and it facilitates connection in some ways. But then there are also arguments that it does the opposite. And I think it's quite possible both could be true. I don't think it has to be a sort of either or. Because did COVID, am I right, did COVID actually throw this up? Because in a sense, it was a study in loneliness, wasn't it? The lockdown. Yeah, and I remember it being termed the pandemic within the pandemic. Yeah, the, the idea that there was a loneliness pandemic created out of the COVID pandemic. And sure, there were studies to corroborate that people felt lonelier during the COVID pandemic, for sure. So it did seemingly exacerbate loneliness. But I I think loneliness was still pretty prevalent before it, but we just didn't, it wasn't on the radar in the same way. Because Gil, who's my mother's, or was my mother's best friend, she still is, but my mother is unfortunately dead. She doesn't want me to know her age, but I'm guessing 95, something like that, but a, a very vibrant woman. She said, you know, she breathed through the first year, but the second year was just excruciating. And I think there's a sort of a hangover from that, that almost the older you get, the harder it is to get back those connections. Yes, and I I definitely think in the work that I've done around older people and loneliness, one of the unique things about growing old, particularly to the very end of the spectrum you're talking about, like 95, is that you lose so many of the things that you held on to, to make you feel less alone. And they could be things like literally your relationships. A lot of people die. Yeah, Gil's best friend is dead. Right as is one of her children and her husband, because living to 95 is, I suppose, a privilege and a curse. Yes. So you lose relationships, your body. You lose its functionality and its integrity in the same way you had 40 years ago. And so people find I'm less able to connect with things that gave me a sense of connection. Even in some people that might be reading, my eyesight's gone, or my hearing or my my legs, I can't walk anymore. If you start to lose things to that extent, including your identity as well, your job, it might have been a big part of who you are. As you lose all of those things, you realize all, they were life rafts in relation to protecting you from loneliness. And I definitely saw a lot of people who were panicked by the fact that everything they'd grabbed onto was slipping away or had slipped away. And that left them in a place of really difficult loneliness. So what were the conclusions? Has the project reported yet, your loneliness project? It it has, yeah. The conclusions, I think that the funder would have liked this is the answer to loneliness conclusion. Move into an elderly or a retirement community. Which we couldn't give them. We could give them more, okay, so you want to know what loneliness looks like? We've shined a torch right on it here, and you can really see what it looks like. But solving it wasn't possible. I actually think in many of these cases, it was like an inevitability. And if I were going to say where the answer might be, I would say it's less about the outside. You can either turn to things on the outside or things on the inside. If you turn to things on the outside, I think you'll eventually lose all of them eventually they will always be lost and you will always have to face whatever it was, the state you were in before you grabbed onto them. I'm not saying that's wrong because I think it's a survival mechanism that, well, what else can we do as humans but turn inwards? And turning inwards is a very vague idea. Spirituality, like we're talking about the unconscious, the parts of ourselves that may be looking at relationships with those things are not really a huge part of our culture. And you can't go to the cinema. Well, I suppose you can go to the cinema with your unconscious, but it's a, it, it looks a bit strange as you're sitting there with a tub of popcorn for, you just look greedy if you're there with two <laughs> tubs of popcorn, don't you? That's true. That's true. Yeah. It's also not something we're taught to do in school, for example, or, or, or right, right from the beginning. I don't think we live in a culture where it's sort of a, 
a way of existence we are very familiar with. I think people who are spiritual might be, and I definitely encountered some people who were, um, and had a very, through religion or of whatever kind, had some sort of sense of that going on that seemed very comforting for them. But actually having a relationship with yourself doesn't necessarily have to come under the banner of spiritual. It could be a psychological sort of kind of thing. But what I'm sort of thinking, and I'd be interested to hear what your research says, is that we sort of need particular skills as well to connect, first of all, with other people and probably also to connect with ourselves. But let's look at the other people first. Because looking at my parents, my mother died earlier than my father. My mother died at 86 and my father died at 91. That my father was completely lost without my mother because she was the one with the social skills. I discovered, and it's amazing, I didn't realise beforehand, he was incredibly shy, but my mother was so outgoing, he just followed on in her wake and he didn't need to have any of those social skills because she eased the path for everything. And in the final years, he was incredibly lonely, mainly because I don't think he had the social skills to actually say to his friends, Let's go round the pub. Yeah, and I think that really speaks to the fact that in many of the relationships we, we will get into, intimate or non-intimate, but particularly intimate, I think, we subconsciously are hoping that our partners will take some of the burdens that we don't want to face off us. And um, like you're saying... Yes, please. <laughs> yeah, that notion. And, and that's very human, isn't it? But if we've allowed the other person to carry certain weights for us for most of the journey, when we lose them, those weights are going to be right back on our shoulders. And um, yeah, I've been there too. I've been there too. What weight were you giving to someone else? For example, I think that in my last long-term relationship that I had, I had a very adventurous partner who was very eager to explore, to climb mountains, travel. And um, I really rode in her slipstream in relation yeah. to those things, you know. But when she was gone, I still wanted those things, but but needed somebody else to help me find them. But I think it's, it's about me finding them in myself. Yeah. It's somehow you've got to, I mean, I had a bereavement in my late 30s and it's really difficult. You, One of the tasks of bereavement is taking back all the material that you've handed over to somebody else. Mm. Or if you can't take them back, in my case, being terrible with DIY, find somebody you can employ to do the DIY. But, you know, you've got to realise just how much stuff you've given to or projected onto somebody else. Yeah. And that's a difficult task. Yeah. And sometimes you've actually deliberately de-skilled yourself to make the connection work. Yes, You know, you had true. those skills, but you'd forgotten, you know, I don't know, how to cook or how to host an evening or something. Yeah, I think that's very true. I also think it's true that in terms of attachment, very close attachment to others, we don't really learn how to do that. And we can often find ourselves in relationships where... We have to warp ourselves and really bend in strange shapes in order to fit with somebody else's way of being so that they'll love us and accept us. And often we can find that it's very peculiar when that person's gone to try and reconfigure ourselves into a different shape. Sort of us shape rather than yeah. accept, rather than acceptable shape. Yes. How are you doing with that task? Well, I think for most of us, that is a... A really difficult one. First, you just have to sort of let the smoke and the fog clear, and then you might get a sight of what you were doing and get an idea of how you might have bent yourself into different shapes or the wrong shapes. Sometimes there's a real shock in that, a kind of goodness. Was I really doing that? Was that, was that really me? But I do think there is a tendency to gravitate back to what you might naturally be if you give it enough time. Or, uh, this is one I've done myself as well after bereavement, because it's so horrible, you've rushed straight into another relationship. And if you're not careful, you just do the same thing all over again. Mm, very true. Or we've actually swapped over. So maybe you had one partner who was really responsible for the 
closeness and the other one was responsible for the separateness. And, you know, you just swap over. And last time round, the person was always wanting you to do things and you were saying, hang on a second. And now you're the person that's always saying, let's do things. And the other person, the new partner is the one that says, hang on. So it's the same dynamic. It feels different at the very beginning, but actually it's the same dynamic. Yeah. And I I think the thing that comes into my head when you're saying that is that we haven't also talked about, I think loneliness can sort of be, it's like a volume switch on a stereo that when it's very, very high, it's very frightening to feel that alone. And I can certainly say in my own life, there are times where there's a low level loneliness and times where it's really like a forest fire. And I think when it's really high, it can drive you to want to get rid of it any way you can. And that could be when you make reckless decisions because you're almost saying, I'll do anything to get rid of this. And even if that is like an evil that I've experienced before or a repetition of a not so great relationship, I think there are times where you take that. So I do think that's an interesting point. Yeah. So what should you do then when the forest fire is raging? I mean, it's very easy for me to sit here and say that now what you should do. But I actually think the wise thing to do, and I remember once a therapist saying to me the very same thing, it's probably wise here to sit down in the forest and just, uh, even though you want to run out of it, it's probably really wise here just to sit down, take a deep breath and look at where you actually are, rather than sprinting around trying to get out. That wasn't something I wanted to hear, but I do think it was the right advice. It was wise. Sort of find a therapist that can sit down beside you in the fire. Yeah, because I am sure that many people are driven into therapy partly because loneliness is in there somewhere with all of the other demons that they might be facing. I think loneliness is often part of the story of a lot of suffering. Because ultimately, and this I'm talking as somebody who, in analysis rather than the therapist, is part of the power of it is actually somebody hearing you, witnessing you, and actually sitting there with you in every sense of the word. That is possibly one of the most powerful parts of it. So that it's almost the opposite of loneliness. Yeah, I think that's very true. And and somebody sitting with you and you really getting the sense that they feel your loneliness and are hearing it is a real balm for the soul. And I definitely remember in our study that a lot of people would say at the end that the method was part of the solution. The fact that you've listened to my story of loneliness from start to finish, which may have taken hours and hours for them to talk about, is in and of itself a really important part of it temporarily alleviating that feeling. You uh, you felt heard, you felt seen, you felt acknowledged. And loneliness is typically about the opposite of that. But I think something we've really got to say that we haven't actually said yet is that loneliness is not a disease to be cured. No. So I got that from you. So explain it to me. Yeah. I mean, going right back to the beginning, what I said was that I really do think that loneliness will visit everyone in lots of different ways and lots of different guises with lots of different masks on, there'll be a different story for how the loneliness arrived and what it means and what's behind it for everyone. But to pathologize that is likely to encourage ideas and thoughts like, I need to get rid of it now. I need it to be gone like a headache. I need to take a paracetamol and get rid of it and numb it and and push it away. But often it's the story that you explore that has some gold in it too. It's like a really important exercise when you do work out where this is coming from, what it's about for you. It's a really important fuel for self-growth potentially if you do manage to sit with it and you do manage to find a therapist or whatever else might be um, appropriate to explore that story and begin to understand yourself. Pushing it away denies you that opportunity too, I guess we have to accept. You know, pushing it away and nulling it does that, nullifying it. So I'll give you the my two things that have helped me in my times of loneliness and sort of moving to a, I've moved from the UK to Berlin, which is 
there was a sort of a, you know, moving to a new city, a new language, et cetera, et cetera, does throw up a certain amount of loneliness. So I'll give you my sort of breadcrumbs that I've found scattered in, <laughs> scattered in the, the forest once the flames have come through. And I'd be interested to hear yours. Let's have yours. For, I, I'll give you mine and then I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Okay. <laughs> So the two things I would say is look for things where there are likely to be ongoing connections. So, for example, I joined a community where you would see each other, you know, it's not just a one-off sort of kind of thing. So you're going back, it's sort of like a they had a meditation group there. They have a book group there. They have a writer's group. Well, actually, I started the writer's group. So the same writers come back. Generally, the same people come back and read the book. Similar people go to meditation class, although the meditation classes are finished. So it's sort of ongoing connections. And also the other thing is to look f- not for an individual, but to look more for your tribe. And this is back to what I was saying about the existential loneliness of feeling the only person in the world that felt like this. Actually, once you get out of your nuclear family, you find lots of other people who thought they were misfits and you are part of the same tribe together, which might be the tribe of people who like David Bowie's music. I don't know. So ongoing connections and looking for tribe are my two breadcrumbs. First of all, what do you think of those? And then let's have your ideas. Yeah, I mean, my first thought is, certainly when you said looking for tribe, that really resonated with me in that one of the things that I have found too, that really alleviated my own feelings of loneliness, are that I found a tribe. And I interestingly found it by following my feelings of loneliness to places where other people were also feeling lonely. And I was very interested in like you were talking about podcasts on discussing some of these aspects of loneliness and discussing how different psychologists might think about it. And I found myself by following that trail in a particular podcast called This Jungian Life. Oh, yeah. I listened to that one and Lisa Marciano has been a guest on this podcast. Ah, right. So well, I, I found myself there and through that community, I met a lot of people who were also interested in exploring their own inner world and following those feelings in a particular way. And that really did lead me to what I feel is tribe. And there is some sense of belonging that comes from that, that definitely, it doesn't cure loneliness but it alleviates and mitigates what I'm saying I think is a default. And wasn't it interesting when we both talked about being an analysis that there was a sort of a feeling of connection at that point? Yeah, true. And I I do feel like, yeah, maybe we, uh, it would be really interesting to talk to you, yeah, about your experiences and how you're finding excavating the depths of being human. Yeah. I mean, my analyst was trained in Germany many, many, many years ago, where actually they don't just do Jungian, they do post-Freudian and child development. So it's slightly different, but it's basically the same kind of task. So I think we should look at a letter in a moment and let's see if that's going to cast any light onto the subject of loneliness, or maybe it won't, but we will find out in just a moment. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. How can I help you have a better relationship? There's nothing I like better than talking to some of the world's top sex and relationship experts. It helps me learn and grow, and that's why I started this podcast. But what makes my life meaningful is writing and teaching. That's why I've written 20 books on relationships, which have been translated into 20 languages. They fall into two categories. Firstly, improve your relationships. In this category, I'd like to recommend Happy Couple Handbook, powerful love hacks for a successful relationship. I cover constructive arguing, be a better listener, use carrots rather than sticks, and how to forgive and move on. In the second category, which is called Rescue Your Relationship, 
I have books like I Love You But I'm Not In Love With You, my international bestseller, Can We Start Again? 50 Questions to Fall Back In Love, My Wife Doesn't Love Me Anymore, and My Husband Doesn't Love Me Anymore and He's Texting Someone Else. You can find out more about these books, along with details about how to get involved with the show and send in your question to be discussed with my guests at my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com. Imagine picking the time and place that works for you and college would just appear. With 100% online classes and personalized support, UMass Global helps you succeed in college wherever you are in life. Major in your future. Visit umassglobal.edu to apply. There are many ways of getting involved with this program. You can go to our website. That's the sort of gateway to everything, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts, where you will find ways of becoming a supporter of The Meaningful Life, getting the bonus material, signing up to my Substack newsletter, where every two weeks you get some news from The Meaningful Life and an article that I've written that hopefully is helpful about making connections. They're nearly all about relationships. Or you can make a connection to us and write in a letter. And here is one that we received. How do I balance what I want and possibly need with what my family needs? The last few years have been brutal, working all hours to small children. My wife and I are exhausted but happy. Our daughters are both at school now and the hard labour years are behind us. I used to play football before we had children. Nothing serious, but one evening a week training and a match day at the weekend, sometimes a bit more. A combination of getting older, cartilage problems, the demands of a young family, and gentle prompting from my wife made me retire. I don't regret it. My playing days were over. However, a friend has suggested that I do a referee course. I'll be able to contribute to the sport I love, get back outside, come home exhausted, but completely satisfied once again. It's a great way to switch off and let the stress roll away. However, the course will involve two weekends away, and although not as much as the commitment is playing, it will eat up lots of time. My wife is sort of supportive, but worried that I will miss out on lots of events for our daughters. Back to my dilemma. I alternate between thinking I need this for myself And when my daughters are teenagers and not interested in doing things with their dad, I'll be too old to start reffing and standing up and being counted as a family man with responsibilities. Over to you, Sam. Yeah, I mean, when I read this, the things that came into my head were that I think that some ways of seeing what it means to be human have described being human or us as multiple selves you know there are lots of lots of people around a committee meeting table and they make up us and sometimes it's like we can very easily over identify with one of the committee members and under identify with other committee members and when i read this i felt like it really sounds like the listener is really saying that he has plowed an awful lot of his energy and resources into being the father, the responsible yeah. family man. Good dad has taken over the chair of the committee and is holding yes. tight to the role. Precisely. And if that's the case, and good dad is too powerful a voice in the committee, that's not necessarily bad, but it might well mean that other committee members are going to start to suffer or their voices are not going to be heard. And it seems like whatever that committee member is, the sport one is part of it. Sporty him has been locked out, basically, of the boardroom. Precisely that, yeah. And uh, I think that... (laughs) And he's banging on the door. (laughs) Yeah. So in some senses, you could say it's a no-brainer in that he needs to probably be allowed in. It would seem very healthy for that energy to be explored, allowed, permitted. It doesn't mean it's going to take over, but it sounds like a dose of it. It sounds like the listener already knows that that's something he wants. Now, as a Jungian, you might have heard this idea. Have you come across James Hollis? Yes, very much so. Also a podcast with him. The great news is he's coming back to do another podcast with us later on in the year. But one of the things he says is the greatest gift you can give your children is leading a fulfilled life yourself. That actually your children seeing that becoming a father doesn't mean abandoning your own life gives them a lesson that 
when they also become parents, they balance what is right for them and what is right for the family. Yes, absolutely. And I think for me, there's also a really nice invitation in this letter for the listener to think about why do I over-identify with the father or the responsible family man? What's my fear? If I were to sort of take some of that energy and put it somewhere else, what's the, what's the reluctance? What's the fear? What's the, what's the concern in relation mm. to that? That's a really good question. And I think to, you know, articulate it, it's that because so, sometimes it's comes to be very black and white. You're either the good family man or you're a heroin addict on the street. I'm exaggerating slightly to make my point, but sometimes there is a very black and white fear. I'm either a, I've had this with clients. I'm either a success or I'm in prison sort of kind of thing. And there's nowhere in between those two things. Yes. And you know, it's interesting you sent this one to me, Andrew, and it reinforces the notion that it's, there's synchronicities in the world. Um, right. That I, I also was, I loved football as a child. I played it in the park. I took my football everywhere to bed. I would kick it around the house, up the stairs, into the bathroom. It was something that I used to express myself in a sort of artistic way. But as I grew older and older and older, and like this listener, responsibilities took over. I lost touch with that, that energy. And um, it's really interesting that in my dreams over the last six months, football has been a very, very common theme. As though my unconscious is saying, you might want to reconnect with this spirit of, of the past and, and reintroduce it. So it was really interesting. I smiled when I read that letter. I identify with that. The other thought I had was, what does it mean to be a family man? What does it mean to be a father? Because that seems to be very much here in this, this letter. I mean, which is a great question to be thinking about. But the question I'm even more interested in is, what was your relationship like with your own father? Because it could be there might be some overcompensation here. You know, the fear is, and this is me making a supposition, so if I'm entirely wrong, please forgive me, that your father was not such a great father, that maybe he didn't show up as a family man. And your fear is that unless you are super dad, that you will end up just like your own father. So it could be that this letter, weirdly enough, is an invitation to have a better relationship with your own father even yeah. though that might be a difficult thing to do. I don't know what you think about that, Sam, as somebody who it sounds like has a complicated relationship with his father. Yeah, for sure. And I think for me, because I had, I had a father who was not really invested in being a responsible father, but very invested in his own fun. My dad was a kind of rocker, essentially, who invested all of his energy in his, his passions. Um, yeah. And very, li very little in us. It was exactly what I did to try to do the opposite and overcompensate for that or over identify with a responsible father role. But that comes at a price. And bizarrely enough, you're still your dad. You're just the not dad as opposed to yourself. <laughs> yeah, you're still kind of defined by his image. Yeah. But it's very common, I think, to see this idea that being a good parent means an almost pathological self-sacrifice. You see that quite a lot. Mm, yeah. And I, I don't know where that comes from, but it's interesting. It's all about balance in the end. And I hope you find a balance between the family needs and your individual needs, because I'm sure that there is a better balance than the one that's actually currently happening. And I wish you luck with that. And if you want to have a similar discussion about something that's... Uh, in your life at the moment, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts. Well, we've nearly run towards the end of the main body of the podcast. So I have to ask you, Sam, what makes your life meaningful? I think actually my answer to that question is, I really feel like my life is made meaningful by engaging fully with all of the spectrum of different parts of being human that crop up in my life. And that, that is loneliness, that is loss, that is love, that is pain. pain. For me, if I don't engage with those things and if I don't follow their energies and follow the trail that they invite me to follow, 
I feel like uh, my life is less meaningful, strangely. So for me, it's about excavating and following and exploring those energies and, and, and integrating them into part of what it means to be me. That's a critical thing for me in terms of meaning. Excellent. It sounds like when the book finally comes out, it's going to be a fascinating read. So um, thank you very much for being with us today. And the conversation, as you've probably got an allusion to, doesn't end here because I'm going to be excavating the three things that Sam knows deep down to be true that I do with all of my guests in the bonus material. And we're going to look at a particular kind of disconnection in the bonus material. And so the question I'm going to be asking Sam is how does internet porn affect romantic life? Because that's something he's also studied. In fact, there's a chapter on this topic in the forthcoming book as well. So if you'd like to hear that conversation and delve deeper into the meaningful life, you can subscribe to the bonus material directly via Apple or Spotify. If you don't use that, we're available on Amazon Music. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.